Thank you. Um, I met David, our videographer, for the first time uh, tonight. He came in and was speaking to me, and uh, I told him who I was, and he said, do you have any funny stories about Pastor Phil? And I said, no, but I wish I did, because when I get on that stage, I can make him feel as bad as he makes me feel telling <laughs> stories about me from the stage. So, But I do not have a story about him tonight, so anyway, too bad. Uh, all right, well... Uh, Johns Hopkins Medical University, uh, one of the professors there has a book and it's entitled The Wonder of the Human Hand. And the book talks about the fact that with our hands, uh, that we interact with our environment in ways that are more sophisticated, that they're more varied and more productive than any other part, part of our body. So um, if you think about how many things you do in the day with the use of your hands, um, our hands have 27 bones, 27 joints, and 34 muscles, and our fingers flex over 25 million times in a lifetime. And if you're a mom, you know that's one of the first things a baby does is grip your finger um, whenever they're born. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the scientist, said this, that, um, that the thumb alone and how complicated it was gave him enough proof to believe in God. And our hands, especially our thumbs, are definitely remarkable, sophisticated pieces of machinery, and it's right to regard them with wonder. So think of some of the idioms we have with the use of the hands. We say, my hands are tied. My hands are full. Somebody give me a hand. We might say, you've got the upper hand. We might say, things are getting out of hand. We might say, get in there and get your hands dirty. Or even we talk about people taking the law in their own hands. Uh, we shake hands to make a deal. We pat someone on the back with their hand to comfort or console them. We raise our hand in court to take an oath, and we fight with our hands. And it's also proven that there's a medical benefit of holding hands to show affection. So if there's any such significance in the wonder of the human hand, what about the wonder of God's hand? And um, even though we know that God is spirit and he doesn't have physical hands, that the hand of God is anthropomorphism. That's a big word for assigning human characteristics to God so that we can relate to him and his character and his nature. And uh, scripture has a lot of those things. It speaks about the face of God, the arms of God, the ears and the eyes and the hands of God. And it was funny because David said to me, he was telling me how he ended up at Scott's Hill. And he said, I met the kids at journey camp. And he said, but then I just left it in God's hands. And I kind of grinned and I thought, perfect example. So scripture actually speaks a lot about God's hand and actually did a search of the use of the hand of God in, um, in scripture. And it was very overwhelming and enlightening, but just a sampling of some things that scripture says about God's hands is that scripture says that God's hands create, sustain, and strengthen. God's hands deliver, redeem, and bless. God's hands lead, correct, and satisfy. And God's hands protect, provide, and motivate. And you saw in your homework this week that there's a phrase throughout the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the good hand of God. And um, in your homework this week was the first instance of that phrase in the book of Nehemiah. In Ezra, God's good hand was for provision and power and protection. But what I'd like to suggest to you is that all the things that God's hand does are a part of the bigger picture of God's providence. And it's a frequent reminder that God works through the, his servants to accomplish his will. The word providence is actually not found in scripture, which I found a little bit amusing because it's a picture of God's invisible hand working all things towards his ultimate goal and purpose. The Heidelberg Catechism defines God's providence this way. The almighty hand and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that all things in fact come to us not by chance but from his fatherly hand. 
Uh, a couple of years ago, John Piper came out with a book called, just entitled Providence, and it's 750 pages long, and this is the way he defines it. He says, the providence of God is his purposeful sovereignty by which he will be completely successful in the achievement of his ultimate goal for the universe. And, you know, we throw around the word sovereignty, which has to do with God's reign and his rule, but providence brings into the picture that God's rule and reign are not random, that he's working towards a purpose and towards a plan. And J. Vernon McGee, the old preacher, says it like this, God's providence is the hand of God in the glove of human events. And I like that. The word providence comes from the root word, you won't be surprised, of provide, showing God's perfect provision for what's needed to direct the universe towards his ultimate plans and goals. So God's sovereignty and his providence might be a scary thing to us if we didn't know that they flow from a God who is only good and always wise. So what if we saw God's providence instead of coincidence or chance in the things that he allows or orchestrates in our lives as a invitation to participate in his grand plans and purposes. Uh, Nehemiah is a man that demonstrates that for us. And our lives as believers should be about fulfilling God's kingdom purposes for us. You think about the vision statement for Scott's Hill is joining God in his work of transforming lives. That means find out where God's providentially working and get on board with his plans. So my main teaching theme for tonight's uh, passage in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 10 is this. God's kingdom is advanced through his people as we exercise bold faith and rely on his providential favor. So in this passage, we're going to see Nehemiah before the king, resulting in pleasure in verses 1 through 8a. Verses 9 and 10, we're going to see Nehemiah before his enemies, resulting in great displeasure. And in between, we see the hand of God working and directing all of those things according to the counsel of his will. So let's start, first of all, with verses 1 through 3, which I'll entitle, Providential Position and Opportunity. Providential Position and Opportunity. Verses 1 through 3, read this. Oh, wait. That is not the verse, is it? <laughs> That's not it. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in the month of Nis Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. All right. In those first three verses, first of all, we see a date reference. And Heather said last week it's been four months since he went before the king. So Kislev from chapter 1, verse 1, is kind of like our November, December. And Nisan in chapter 2, verse 1, is like our April, May. So it's been that long since Nehemiah had first heard the condition of the city of Jerusalem. And Hannah and I brought him that news. And he's been patiently waiting for an opportunity to go before the king. And of course, this time of waiting, Waiting was not wasted. Uh, when we wait on something, it deepens our burden for that thing. It developed his vision and plan. And it was a time of concentrated prayer for God to providentially form that vision within him and for him to pray for success. Um, at the end of chapter one, we got kind of a, just a little footnote that said Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. And historically, a cupbearer was a very high-ranking official in charge of serving the king's wine. And it was the responsibility of him to serve at the royal table. 
And um, since there were plots to poison the king, the cupbearer had to guard the cup carefully and would sometimes taste the drink before serving it to ensure that it was safe. So this was a life-threatening job. So basically, Nehemiah takes the drink and he dies and the king knows not to drink it. So he's putting his life at risk. But due to the responsibilities of that position, he had to be a trustworthy and loyal and a cupbearer had to have the king's confidence. And because of the character that he was able to exert influence in the royal court. So he wasn't just a servant, he was an advisor. And God had providentially put Nehemiah in that high position position of influence. Um, just like Esther, who was providentially raised up as the queen of Persia, as the scripture said, for such a time as this, so is Nehemiah. And in the book of Esther, we don't even see God's name mentioned. And it was probably the most disputed book to be placed in the canon of scripture because it didn't have God's name in it. And the reason that they decided to include it is because it is a beautiful picture of the providence of God. And it's clear that the writer of Esther wants you to know that God's hand is in every twist and turn of the ironies that take place within that book. So, and of course, Ezra is connected to the books in Ezra and Nehemiah is that that story kind of falls between the returns of Zerubbabel and Ezra that Heather spoke of in the introduction. So verse one says that Nehemiah approaches the king with the wine and he's sad in the king's presence. And the king uh, notices and questions him. And verse two says he's very much afraid. Why is he afraid? Well, he was going to be asking the king to reverse an official decree, official policy decision that he had made before. In Ezra 4.21, um, it says this, Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease and that this city not be rebuilt until a decree is made by me. Persian decrees were irrevocable. And the only way to get around them was to issue another decree to kind of counteract what was happening. So that's the first reason he was afraid. Secondly, he's going before the most powerful man in the entire world, the king of the known, the highest position in the land. The other thing is he shouldn't be sad in the king's presence. It may be seen as disloyalty or an insult um, to go before them. Esther even said that to her uncle Mordecai when she was going before the queen. But Nehemiah had the same mindset of Esther as in 416 that says, I will go before the king and if I perish, I perish. But instead, God uses the trigger of Nehemiah's sadness to set in motion a providential opportunity for him to present the burden and the plan to the king. And because of the relationship that they had, the king notices that he's sad and he's not sick. So something's bothering him and his countenance can't really be contained. But notice how Nehemiah responds to his fear. The opposite of fear is courage and faith. And a person of courage is going to take the same actions whether or not they're afraid. A person of faith is going to step out with the supernatural shield of faith, as Ephesians tells us, and fight their fear instead of being paralyzed by it. So Nehemiah speaks up in a very discerning way. First of all, uh, he responds with great wisdom because he has deep respect for the king's position. He says, long live the king. And you know he had said these words hundreds of times, but yet today they kind of came with an extra dose of meaning. He wanted the king to know that his sadness was not related to his service to the king, that the king had nothing to be suspicious of or to be fearful of, that his life was not in danger. Um, but Nehemiah also had a deep burden for his country. And if you notice, they don't mention Jerusalem. It says the city, the place where my father's graves are, because what would Jerusalem have invoked in the mind of the king? A rebellious people. And so he doesn't mention the name of the city. Uh, but in that day, mentioning respect for the graves of your elders and um, the gates of your city would have invoked a lot of sympathy from the king. So he repeats from chapter 1, verse 3, that the city is in ruins and that the gates are burned. So Nehemiah doesn't try to pretend there's nothing wrong, but he 
discerningly shares the burden of his heart. And the other thing is, this is not a selfish uh, mission for Nehemiah. Let me come in and save the day and be the hero that Heather talked about last week. It's about the kingdom of God and the people of God being able to live out the call of God to dwell securely with him and to spread his name to the surrounding nations. So from that first section, I have a few questions. How about you? Do you consider the present job or position that you're in to be a divine appointment under the direction of the providence of God? How are you doing at waiting on the Lord's timing for something you're eager for or feel is urgent? Do you wait for God's providential timing or do you speed ahead with your own agenda? Are you sensitive to opportunities in that position to testify or minister to others or by faith speak up when God opens the door? Are you respectful and discerning as you re- discerning as you approach others, especially authority figures? Do you even have a deep burden for the kingdom of God that causes you to overcome your fear of man and step out in faith and courage for him using the supernatural weapons that the Holy Spirit has given you? God has placed, just like Nehemiah, each one of us in our respective roles and positions for such a time as this to take providential opportunities that he provides to be a part of building the kingdom of God. So that's verses one through three. Verses four through five, let's read those. Providential vision and objective. Providential vision and objective. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So the moment of presenting his vision and objective of going to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls has finally come by direct request from the king. He says, what do you want? What's your request? This is the moment your hands get sweaty and your heart starts pumping very quickly just like mine are being on the stage. But uh, Nehemiah's immediate response is this. So I prayed to the God of heaven. He seeks the favor of divine providence. This quick arrow prayer shows his humility and his deep dependence on God, the king of heaven, granting him favor with the king on earth. Uh, Notice he says, I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I asked, turned and said something to the king. Sometimes I get that backwards. (laughs) You know, sometimes we have the uh, mindset of it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. So, but anyway, uh, he prayed and then he asked the king. But Nehemiah knew the truth of Proverbs 21.1, which says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. You'll notice that phrase, hand of God, more and more as you read the scripture. I was so sensitive to it, but it's even in the passage you had in your homework this week. But as Heather said last week, his quick arrow prayer was built on a solid foundation of uh, extended prayer with the Lord. His emergency prayer, it's one thing for us to go in and say, oh, Lord, give me the right words. Give me the right tone. Give me wisdom and give me the courage to say what you want me to say. But that's built on a groundwork of consistent, persevering prayer that he had in chapter 1. So he also, another thing we notice about Nehemiah, he doesn't arrogantly think that, okay, God's called me to this, so I don't need permission from the king. Um, He didn't need backing. He, again, is so respectful. He says, um, and so humble, he says, if it pleases you, he calls himself your servant. If your servant has found favor in your eyes, send me. Give me your blessing and your backing that I may go in your authority. And Romans 13, 1 tells us that God providentially places all rulers and governing authorities in their positions, that they're instituted by him. They are his servants to carry out his plans. And ultimately, ultimately, Nehemiah knew he needed a providential favor in order for such a huge request to be answered affirmatively by the king. So again, I ask you these questions. When you're finally presented with an opportunity, how do you respond? Do you fearfully withdraw or do you faithfully pray knowing that you're dependent on God? Do your emergency prayers have the foundation of a deeper prayer life that knows and values the character of God and wants to align with his purposes? Uh, Do you arrogantly think that when God calls you to something that you don't need the affirmation of human authority figures in your life? Or do you see authority in your life as providentially placed there by God? Do you have a vision 
for seeing the personal broken walls of your life and those of the kingdom of God or the church restored. Do you have the perspective of Nehemiah? Here I am, send me. This was the heart of Nehemiah in verses four and five. Uh, Moving on to verses six through eight, we see providential provision and outcome. Providential provision and outcome. And verses six, six through eight read this. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. So the king responds, as verse 6 says, that it pleased the king to send me because I had given him a time. First of all, why the parenthetical note that the queen was sitting beside him? There are a few commentators who think that this queen was actually Queen Esther herself, but most likely Esther was the wife of the previous king, Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, and she was been the stepmother of the current king, Artaxerxes. And her Jewish influence surely would have had an influence on the present king, making him more favorable to the plight of the Jews. So the fact that uh, the king wanted to know how long Nehemiah would have, was going to be gone shows how valuable Nehemiah was to the king. He didn't want to lose him as a trusted advisor. But it does make you wonder, did he asked for 12 years off because that's how long he was the governor initially before he went back. So it wouldn't be nice to go into your boss and say, hey, can I have a 12-year leave of absence with pay? Uh, We don't know. Maybe he just kept extending that as the project went on, but we're not sure. But the fact that Nehemiah knew how long it would initially take for the project and the resources that he needed shows that he has been doing some not just praying, but planning um, during those four months. And sometimes we kind of pit praying and planning against one another as if they're not compatible. Um, and Heather mentioned last night, a very important, last week, a very important thing that he prayed four months and it only took 52 days to um, complete the wall, noting the importance of prayer. But I read this statement a long time ago and it's kind of stuck with me and it's to pray and wait on God to do something that his word has already commanded that I should do is spiritualized laziness. But to plan without seriously asking God for guidance is making an idol of my own plans. And I think that's a good balance. The commentator David Guzik says this. He says, the four months in prayer were not only spent in talking to God, but also in listening to him and in working out a spirit-led plan for what to do when God did open the door. And you had a couple of Proverbs in your homework this week that spoke to that too. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord, that's the prayer, and your plans will be established. That's the planning. Proverbs 16.9, the heart of man plans his way, there's the planning, but the Lord establishes steps, and there's the praying. So these Proverbs kind of give us a relationship between praying and planning. So not only did the king give Nehemiah the permission backed by his authority to go to Jerusalem, we see in verses 7 and 8 that he actually went above and beyond that, the extra mile, and provided abundant provision. So as we seek God in prayer and we plan diligently, God often goes above and beyond what we imagine. So Nehemiah, um, in bold faith, asked for letters to pass through the land of Judah's enemies. There'd be places that he would need administrative authority to pass. It would take three or four months of travel for him to get to Jerusalem. And it was a dangerous, long route, and he would need letters to pass by. And verses 6 and 7 indicate that it pleased the king to give them. Nehemiah, in bold faith, asked for physical resources from the king's forest to get timber and beams for the gates and the walls and for Nehemiah's personal residence. And this was like an unlimited Lowe's gift card or a blank check at a building supply store, you know, and yet it pleased the king to give them. 
So Nehemiah had done his planning as God had formed a vision within him and he knew what needed to be done. He had counted the cost and God now makes provision for his vision to become a reality. And then we come to the key verse of that passage, chapter uh, verse eight. B says this, and the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. Your Bible may say for the good hand of God or according to the good hand of God, but that's the cause of Nehemiah's request being fulfilled. God's providential hand of power and protection and provision and security and safety was extended to Nehemiah. Nehemiah wanted to know that he had been sent by the king. He wanted to know that he had been, he was going to be safe. He wanted to know that he was going to be supplied. And that grace was extended to him as a providential favor from the hand of God, not because of his own persuasive leadership. Nehemiah was at God's disposal to do God's kingdom work and accomplish his purposes. Think about this. Nehemiah was leaving the palace of Susa for the broken down city of Jerusalem. He was leaving the luxurious gates of the Persian empire for um, gates that were burned down in a city that was unprotected. He was leaving the comfort and convenience for hardship and opposition, as we'll see in the last couple of verses. But Nehemiah knew the truth of the gospel writers that said this, if anyone would deny himself, and come after, take up his cross and come follow me. Well, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Nehemiah was willing to kind of die to himself to follow God's call and plan on his life. He knew to surrender his life, pray, plan, and God would, in his grace, would providentially provide the outcome. So how about you? Are you just a prayer? Are you just a planner? Or do you see the value in God using both? Even though you pray and plan, do you see the outcome as God's good hand of providence or do you take credit? Are your prayers and plans God-focused at accomplishing his kingdom plans or are they self-focused at fulfilling your own plan, purposes and pleasures? Have you counted the cost of being a disciple of Christ and part of the kingdom knowing that he will supply everything you need? Um, and are you willing to leave the comfort and convenience of where you are to go do something bold for God's kingdom? The last section is verses 9 and 10, and we'll label those providential protection and opposition. Providential protection and opposition. Verses 9 and 10 say this, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the wealth of the people of Israel. Nehemiah embarks on the 900 mile journey from Susa to Jerusalem to act on what God has called him to do. Beyond the river would have been beyond the Euphrates River. And once you cross that river, you were in a new uh, um, area headed towards um, Judea. And we learn from verse 9 that not only had Nehemiah been given official letters, but he had been given the king's army and horsemen as well. When Ezra was faced with a similar situation, he did not want to confuse uh, the king about his trust in God's hand of protection. So he refused the army of the king. We read in Ezra 8 verse 22 this, for I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way since we had been told uh, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. And I think a takeaway we can get from that is that God works in different servants of his in different ways, different convictions. God's provision can look different in one person's life than it does in another person's life, and one doesn't sh isn't prescriptive or showing a lack of faith. So they both knew their ultimate protection was from the Lord's hand, and by God's providence, it looked different in the lives of both of those two servants. We also see that God's providence doesn't exempt us from opposition as we grow in our sanctification and pursue building up God's kingdom. Because when these enemies saw that Nehemiah was seeking the welfare of the city, they were greatly displeased because they were only interested in fulfilling their own agenda. Who were these enemies? We see, first of all, Sanballat the Horonite, Heronium was a town in Moab. Later, we're going to learn that um, Sambalat was the governor of Samaria. And if you remember when the kingdom of Israel split into uh, Israel and Judah, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. We see Tobiah was the Ammonite. 
So who are the Moabites and the Ammonites? They were the two sons of Lot from the incestuous relationship he had, um, they had with his daughters after the, his wife was turned to a pillar of salt when they were escaping Sodom and Gomorrah. So anytime you see these ites in scripture, you have a picture of the enemy of God and his people. They were the Canaanites that had been driven from the land. And we're going to see these two throughout the book. So the good hand of God does not always mean smooth sailing. So contrast their displeasure with the pleasure of Artaxerxes in sending him. And although Nehemiah had the supreme authority of the king of heaven and the king of earth, even though he had the supporting strength of the king's army and horsemen, he ultimately experienced satanic opposition. And the same is true for us. Jesus tells his disciples that just as the world hated him, that it's going to hate them. And in Matthew 28, before Jesus ascends back to heaven, he gives believers the command, backed by his authority, to go and make disciples, to build up his kingdom. But along that journey, we're going to experience opposition. Um, John 16, 33, Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says that indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So questions on this last section. Do you see trials or opposition as ordained by God's providence to strengthen you and cause you to grow in your faith? Do you see God's providential hand working differently in other people's lives as we each seek him and how he wants us to respond? Do you recognize that your opposition is really not against flesh and blood, but satanic opposition to God's purposes being fulfilled? If so, are you fighting with the spiritual weapons given to us by God's spirit and his word? In Nehemiah 2, uh, we see Nehemiah who's seated at the right hand of the king He's the cupbearer willing to lay down his life for the king if necessary. But he leaves the glory of Susa to go identify with God's people and accomplish God's kingdom purposes. So who's the greater Nehemiah? Jesus. The greater Nehemiah is Jesus because he left the glory of heaven to go and identify with his people, redeeming us and making a way for us to be reconciled to God and dwell with him. Jesus was willing to drink the cup the Father had for him, even if it meant his death. So, the redemption that Christ provides by his death is the beginning of a life of sanctification that requires bold faith and the providential favor of God. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 tell us this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the bold faith. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's the providential favor of God. Nehemiah had direct access to the throne of the king of earth. But because of the incarnation, the death, the resurrection, and ascension of Christ, we have direct access to the throne of the king of heaven. Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So we've seen the good hand of God in the life of Nehemiah. We see his providence in the position and opportunity that were given to Nehemiah. We see God's providence in the vision and objective for God's kingdom work given to Nehemiah. We see God's providence in the provision and outcome when approaching the king. And we see the, the, God's providence in the opposition and protection when faced with enemies of God's kingdom. In the same way, by God's providence, he has each one of us where we are. He's gifted us each differently to participate in his grand plan and purpose for the universe. He's made abundant provision for us to be part of building up that kingdom. And he protects his own as we experience opposition in pursuing his kingdom plans. So I pray that as we go about living our lives for God's glory, that we'll look for the good hand of God because God's kingdom is advanced through his people as we exercise bold faith and rely on his providential favor. I want you to think about the last words of Jesus on the cross. He said this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was saying, I give my life I, to fulfill your great plans and purpose for my life. Could we say just like that, Father, into your hands, I commit my life to fulfill your greater plan and purpose for me?
the great reformer Martin Luther said these words. He says, I've held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Yes, our hands are remarkable creations, but they don't compare to the providential, gracious, good, and wise hand of our great God. I think about one uh, verse in scripture that places human hand and God's hand in the same verse. And in Acts 2.23, when Peter's preaching, he tells them that Jesus died at the hands of wicked men, but that he was delivered over or handed over to them by the deliberate plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus committed his life into the Father's hand and he received it back at the resurrection. And so will we. Psalm 95, 7 tells us this. It's a beautiful picture. He is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, the sheep, the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. And John 10 assures us that all who belong to Christ, that no one can snatch them from the Father's hand. So, in closing, there's an anonymous little poem that says this. If you know that God's hand is in everything, you can leave everything in God's hand. I love that. If you know God's hand is in everything, you can leave everything in God's hand. So thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him to work that out in our hearts as we leave here tonight. Father, you are so good and your providence is so sweet. And Father, um, we know that you are only good and that you are all wise and that you have each one of us placed where we are for such a time as this. I pray that we would look for your providential hand and that we would join you in your work of building up the kingdom of God, even in the midst of opposition. Father, I pray that we would trust your loving hand of providence, that we would give ourselves over to it to fulfill the purpose that you have created us for, and that's to be in relationship with you, to dwell with you, to make your name known to the nations. We love you. We just commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen.